Uh, I'm going to have a talk about uh, LARP as an educational tool. And LARP as a learning process. Uh, it will both encompass informal but mainly formal education. It will also overlap some of the other talks that you have heard and hopefully that will be useful reference point for you. Um, one of the most interesting quotes about learning that I've heard is that it is a base human drive. It is as natural as uh, finding food, having sex, reproduction, and it is something that we do from day one when we learn. And we learn from all experiences. We are programmed to adapt and learn from everything that we experience in life, including LARP. And it doesn't matter if it's educational or, or, or just recreational LARPing, you will still learn from it. The difference is that in educational LARP, we try to design it to learn a specific thing or a subject matter. I would like you to think of yourself for the word fun, because we usually say that, oh, that LARP was fun. And is a LARP always fun? How many think that a LARP is always fun? Yeah? No, that's, that's okay. What about interesting? There are many different views on learning, on how it happens and explanation models. To give you some tools to further discuss this, because it does connect to how you choose to design your games, I will talk a little bit about this background. Because educational design choices, it reflects your view of learning, of how an individual develops. And this can be very different depending on what country you're from and what your personal opinion and view of this matter is. One sort of slider uh, that you could use in this is determinism versus freedom. Are we all determined uh, to go the path that we are walking? Uh, is it in our genes, in our inheritance, or in our family re relations? Does that determine what kind of individuals we will be? Are we fated to become a certain thing? or can we choose it ourselves? Also, are we all in the, uh, in the beginning individuals? Or are we all born unique? And how should education be formed based on that? Also, are our actions the result of outer influence? Or do we ourselves rule over our actions regardless of what happens outside of us? Of course, none of this is either or. Most of us would probably be in the middle. But regardless of what school you're from, or what education system is dominated in your country, it is likely that you will probably have an opinion of either of these things. There are some learning theories. This is a gross simplification of them. I will just give you some background because it will give you an understanding. And different teachers that you've had in your past will probably lean more or less to different of these theories. And so will you when you design your educational labs. Um, one of the historical very strong influences has been the cognitive learning theory. Uh, they believe that a human is more or less an empty vessel uh, that can be filled, that we are more or less um, like animals, that uh, desired behaviors should be encouraged and discouraged with the help of rewards and punishment. Uh, one of the most uh, famous examples is probably Pavlov's dogs, that probably, some of you probably are um, familiar with. Uh, very typical for these types of learning um, techniques is to use a lot of gold stars, praising, rewards, um, and that you need an outer reward uh, for doing the correct behavior or showing the proper skills that you want to learn. Another very strong historical influence is the humanistic learning theory. This is a very different take on human development. And this is about that we ourselves have all the knowledge and potential within ourselves. And it needs to be awakened and stimulated and nourished. And this is a very different view from the cognitive learning theory. And here they also talk much more about your inheritance. That where you come from, your culture and your inner will and your inner soul uh, matters uh, to your learning. A very strong modern influence, at least in the Swedish and Scandinavian education system, is Vygotsky. Um, that's where you talk more about interhuman relationships, mentorship, the relationship, the language as a tool for all learning. And a very interesting term that comes with this theory is uh, something that I would like to focus on and use a lot, and that's the proximal development zone. 
Here I write that it's what a child can do and what a child can't do, but it can really be anyone. In the first zone, it is what you can do yourself. In the third zone, it is what you can't do, because you don't have the knowledge, the skills, perhaps you're too small, too weak, not fast enough. But in the proximal development zone, that is what you can do when you are assisted. That's what the child can do in the company of an adult. And theorists can argue that although an adult is not present, when you are playing, or LARPing in our case, we create a fictional adult. If we played mother and child, then I, even though we are the same age, I am the fictional adult. And through play and through games, we create a proximal development zone that will help us develop beyond our original abilities. When you have an aha moment, <coughs> what led you up to that? I hope that you have had an aha moment quite recently, since you are here at the <laughs> summer school. <laughs> but it's really quite interesting when you design your games to think about, in ordinary life, when I'm not laughing, what is an aha moment? Because usually we become very, very focused on the formal rewards or the formal assessment that we receive in schools. So, designing LARPs then, moving on. How do I know if they get it? Because this is super important if you're going to design educational LARPs, no matter what target group you have. You have to be able to assess how well your game is working. Why? Well, first of all, when you talk about assessment, you usually think about it as feedback to students, because you have all received grades in school at some point, right? But it's also about feedback to the teacher, or the game designer in our, in our case, to get to know how well is my game actually working. And some about formative and summative assessment. Uh, summative assessment, um, that would be um, this. <laughs> uh, it's basically receiving a grade. The, this is how good you are uh, at this. No more information. That would represent getting a grade in school with no comments to it. Formative assessment, on the other hand, that will give you the information you need in order to progress in your learning. That will tell you what to do next. And this is a model that sort of contains the different parts of formative assessment, of formative learning processes. And all this, I would argue, can be integrated in a game design. I will explain. First of all, it is extremely important to clarify the goals and success criteria. Because if you don't do this and you design, for example, a competitive game, like the village, if I would tell you that, okay, so the people who success in this class will be the ones who manage to win the vote. That is how I will measure how well you are learning this game. And if I didn't tell you that the game is not about winning the vote, uh, if you were a class of students, you might very well assume that it's by winning the vote that you would success in this activity. So when you design games, and when you introduce games to students, they must know what you expect from them and how they can show their skills. Uh, and that's why you design activities that will make it visible so that it's not actually something that, that you tell them, oh, you should think about this and, and just feel this stuff. That you have to design the games and activities and parts of the activities uh, so that they can show what they have learned and so that they can make it visible to the teacher, to you and to themselves. They need to, somewhere in the game, get feedback on what to do next, so that you don't leave them at their own leisure and say that, OK, well, here's the game, just play with it and learn by yourself. They need to be given feedback. What should I do next? You can't expect them to get it in the first, after the first explanation. They need to know and get feedback continuously on what they are doing well. Lastly, design games so that students can help and learn from each other. This is very, very the common case in LARPs, that it is not cheating to ask your neighbour and to help each other get better at the game that you are doing. And by doing all of this stuff, you can make the student the owner of their own learning process, because they know what is expected of them, what success looks like. They receive the feedback that they need in order to do this, <coughs> and they understand where they are at the moment. And by doing this, they feel motivated because they are the owner of their own learning process. So, in short, for game design, think about what success looks like. Not just what you want them to learn, 
But how does success look like in my game? When is it successful? How do the students show this? How can they demonstrate their knowledge and skills? And not just for grading, but for, to give you feedback as a game designer, if they have learned or not from the game. And how will they receive feedback on their performance during and after the game? A little bit about the different activities and, and what can be included in, tor in order to achieve this. Uh, before a game, usually when you do an edu lap, you, you write the entire game and then you just run it. But it doesn't have to be that way. There are schools and people who work with laps as projects, as part of a, of a larger work in school. And then the preparation for a game can also be part of the learning process. For example, if you were to make a game about uh, guerrilla warfare, uh, they, you might give them a homework. You are going to examine what life was like for guerrilla soldiers. Uh, and especially with focus on social power structures within the group. We will later use this homework and the result of this to discuss and come up with a good game design and to characters that should exist in this group. So part of the design can actually be the preparations for the game. And suddenly the students' homework is no longer something that they just do because you ask them to. It's something that's actually useful to them in the next part of their work. They might also need to practice skills. Uh, the image here is from a UN roleplay, one of the examples that Eric mentioned in his history of LARP. Uh, there the students actually have to practice writing draft resolutions the same way that they do in the real UN. So they actually have to learn new skills in order to be able to play the game. You also might have to make props. This is not usually a part of an educational game, but if you do it over several subject matters in school, then you will actually be able to create props for a game as a part of, for example, handicraft, sewing, or woodworking, uh, if you need props for the game. Then it's not something that they just do, because they have to do it in school, but something that they can actually use in the LARP project. So many different subjects in school can be involved in the preparation for a LARP. During the LARP runtime, it's important that they get formative feedback, either from you, for their peers or for, from the game system, so that they understand what is going on and what's going to happen next. An example is, for example, in the game The Village, then they are constantly being given feedback and it's clarified why did the vote turn out as it did. An alternative, if they weren't given feedback in The Village, would be that you simply play the game, you had the vote, but you didn't understand what you were voting for or what is going on. You were given the result after the game. That would not be formative feedback. Formative feedback is being given feedback during the game runtime. Checkpoints can be a good idea to visualize learning, to make it visible what's going on. If you're going to make decisions during a game, having the students make notes of what is going on, or maybe not making notes, maybe recording a small video about what they are doing at the moment and why they are doing it, will help them remember and reflect later on what happened during the game and why. Especially for games that goes on for longer than, a f than one hour, it can be a good idea to have checkpoints to remember what, why decisions were made. Also, some games will provide you with documentation. In a game like the Monitor Celesta, we had a huge digital support system that could, be, that could record everything from where the spaceships went to what decisions were made at certain points. In you and roleplays, you have documentation in the form of speeches, draft resolutions, and notes taken by the representatives of the countries. All this can be used to discuss and reflect on the learning process of the LARP, and later for assessment. In the after talk comes the summary of the game. It is important here, as you will learn later on and probably already have experience, to just let the players talk about their experience because it's something that helps them learn from a personal perspective. But it's also important to think about how we interpret the games and to design this process carefully so that the interpretation takes start with the player's own experience and not as a something that you as a game designer think is important. Uh, this is called generalization. The game can also be used as a future reference point. For example, if you have a strong experience, you can tie new facts to that experience so that it's easier to understand it, even though it might have been several weeks or months since the LARP went. A bit about generalization. It is the ability to turn the experience from one occasion into knowledge that you can use later on. Some people do this naturally, like some people find it easy to learn how to read and count. But you can't trust all your players to do this by themselves. So this is something that you need to design into the debrief process of the LARP, so that your players can use the experience from the LARP 
later on. Because if you just leave them with reflecting on their own actions and what happened in the game, it might be hard for them to see how can I use this later on and what does this mean in a larger context. And like I said, it's important that the generalization start with the experience that the participant has and not as the game master's interpretations of the actions in the game. Because if it starts with the game master's interpretation, the players might feel exposed and it might also not be very relevant for them in the future if they had not experienced what the game master interpreted. I'm going to give you some thoughts on design choices um, with regards to the different sliders. With regards to openness, um, considering the fact that we need to be clear about the goals and success criteria of the game, it can be hard to design an educational game with absolutely zero transparency. It might be tempting believing that non lapis or unexperienced players can't play with any kind of uh, transparency. And it might be true in some cases that it's harder. But not giving them any information about, at all about the game's purpose and what's going to happen will make it very, very hard for them to show their skills or to understand what's expected of them, especially in formal education. Therefore, I would argue that some amount of openness, especially regarding your expectations for the game and what the participants are meant to learn and experience, is quite encouraged. Player pressure, if you design the game to be very hardcore. Is it really necessary for the players to be wet, hungry, cold and mis miserable to understand what life in a prisoner of war camp can be like? Maybe. Maybe that could be a very good experience, but do remember that physical and emotional hardship that impairs our empathic ability, which is really, really important for us to be able to reflect and be open to other people's experiences, both our co-players and those of people in other places in the world. It makes us shivering, scared little hamsters. And shivering, scared little hamsters are not very good at generalizing a process. On the other hand, if you make the game too easy, if it's all pretense and no challenge at all, the players might find it boring because the game is no longer in their proximal development zone. It's all in the blue zone. I can do this already. It's not even challenging. That doesn't make the game meaningful to the players or to the teacher or to the game master. This state can also be defined as flow as the place where you have to strain yourself just enough so that you can overcome the challenges and that you get just enough support so that you can overcome the challenges in front of you. This can be very different within a player group. Some players will need more support than others and it's your job as a game master if you're facilitating the game or as a game designer to give instructions to the person game mastering so that they can facilitate the game that can accommodate the target group. With regards to loyalty to setting, you should think about when it's important to be close to the setting. I had a very interesting talk with Johanna, and you have heard his talk about Halat Hisar, about what kind of sacrifices they had to make with plausibility, that is, how real the game should be compared to making it fun. And the interesting thing that he told me was that he didn't feel that they had to sacrifice that much, because the important part of Halat Hisar was to experience the world and the setting where this took place. If Halat Hisar had been a family drama set in the time of occupation in a country, then you might have to think more about changing the setting of the occupation in order to make the drama playable. But in that case, he, they could make a game that was quite plausible and playable at the same time. There's also a risk if you would make a game very playable and you don't inform your players about this that they may misinterpret this as being the real thing. We will get back to that when we talk about accountability more in detail and give close examples. But if, for example, they would tone down a lot of the oppression in Halat Isar and still say that, well, this is what it's like, this is exactly what it is like, without any disclaimers with regards to this is just a game or 
For example, if the students who were in the prisoner for a day were told that this is exactly what it's like to be a prison, uh, in a prison camp, uh, then that could be a misinterpretation, especially if people are not experienced LARPers or have tried the format before. They don't really know how to generalize this process. So be careful about what kind of information you give to the players. That does not mean that their experience is not important. It only means that they have to get help in how to interpret this. And it's very tempting to design games just for fun or in be interesting as well. When I run games with students, I always let them give feedback. Even if I can see and hear from their reflection that the game seems to have worked really well, I always ask them, how did you like the game? Very often they give me suggestions like, oh, it would be a lot more fun if we did it like this. But for me, designing an edulog, fun is actually not the primary objective. It should be interesting. It should be just challenging enough, and it should be able to accomplish the goal of the game. Now that might not always be the main goal for the students, especially students whose main interest is going out in the corridor and looking after a love interest and wanting to have the next iPhone or something. Um, so it's tempting to just try to accommodate the, the wishes for fun and interest and coolness in games, but remember that is not always your primary objective. Also, your bias as a game master um, can shift focus quite a lot. If you really, really want to prove a point in a game, it is possible that you might shift it from being plausible uh, to being playable or the other way around um, so that it becomes less realistic. I will now do what uh, Johanna Kolyanen did and I will say that if you forget everything that I have said, please, please remember these last slides. Models, including uh, the, uh, the mixing desk of LARP and uh, learning models, are just models. They are not the same thing as reality. They are tools to help us talk about reality. Because if we don't have any tools or any vocabulary to talk about things, it would be very hard to create LARPs together. But remember that there can be different views on these things, and it does not always work to describe reality. And the same thing can be said about a LARP. There will never be a one-to-one -one or a 100% um, correlation between a LARP and the real thing. But it doesn't have to be. Maybe in a LARP like A Prisoner for a Day, the correspondence ratio about the actual experience of being a player in that LARP or having been a, a prisoner in that camp is just 1%. The important thing when you do educational LARP is to think about what does that 1% has to contain and how can you facilitate a learning process around this 1%. And also about learning in LARP, um, all LARPs will teach your participants something. Uh, the question is what? Um, do you want the shivering hamster to get better at surviving? Uh, the shivering hamster is excellent at learning how to survive uh, LARPs that are extremely uh, challenging and, and tough. Uh, so they will certainly learn something from such a LARP, but maybe not the stuff that you would like them to learn in the longer run. Um, so no matter what you do with your participants, of course they will learn. It's up to you to find out ways to uh, evaluate how well they learn these things to ask the right questions and to find ways of analyzing and documenting your LARP. Uh, and also, um, I would like to ask uh, the experts in this room, how many of you have at some or several points of your life realized that through role playing you have gained skills of decrypting and, and analyzing social situations that have helped you come through and manage tough situations in your regular life? So this can be a very useful uh, tool to actually get better at just getting by. No matter what occupation or future you choose for yourself, you will learn very useful skills by just role play, even if it's not edularp. And um, then I would like to see if there are any questions regarding this talk.
in that case, uh, that's all for me, and thank you very much for your time.